The following is a conversation between Larry Brilliant, chairman of the Skoll Global Threats Fund, and Denver Frederick, host of The Business of Giving, on AM 970 The Answer in New York City. Back in July, Dr. Larry Brilliant joined us to discuss the launch of an HBO movie that he had produced called Open Your Eyes, a compelling story of a husband and wife in Nepal having their sight restored as a result of the work of the Seva Foundation founded by Dr. Brilliant and his wife. Well, he's been good enough to come back and join us again this time to discuss his memoir that will be released on Tuesday and aptly entitled Sometimes Brilliant. Good evening, Larry, and welcome back to The Business of Giving. Nice to see you again, Denver. Thank you. You have had a most remarkable life, so much so it's hard to know where to begin. But I think I'll start with you sitting in Hill Auditorium on the University of Michigan campus on November 5th, 1962, listening to a speech. Tell us about that day and the impact that it had on you. I think everybody uh, who's gone to college remembers the sophomore year. It's a, it's a tough year anyway. And for me, it was tougher because my dad was dying of cancer. And, mm-hmm. and as it would turn out, my dad and my grandfather both died uh, inside of five days. Oh, and wow. So it was a tough time. And I had uh, no inner resources to deal with that. I sort of locked myself up in my room and in South Quad in Ann Arbor, and I think I was gobbling down burnt peanuts and reading uh, Superman. That was my high and exalted way of dealing with depression. Uh, And I saw a little note in the college newspaper, the Michigan Daily, that said that Martin Luther King was going to be on um, campus. Hmm. Nobody really knew who Martin Luther King was. He hadn't yet given his speech, I Have a Dream. He didn't yet have his Nobel Prize. The world outside was filled with the Cuban Missile Standoff, uh, Bob Dylan was singing A Hard Day's, Hard, hard Rain's Gonna Fall. Yeah, and that's right. It was a pretty complicated moment. And it was raining and <clears throat> miserable weather, but somehow I took my sophomoric ass out of that <laughs> dorm and <laughs> wandered into the auditorium, and, uh, and hardly anybody came. Mm-hmm. This huge auditorium that holds 3,000 people, it was hardly half filled or even less. And the president was embarrassed, introduced Martin Luther King, and he looked out, and instead of feeling bad, he laughed. He just laughed. Mm. And he said, you all come on up here and sit on stage. There'll be more of me to go around. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, not everybody went up on stage. They kind of crowded the opening of the stage, and we all listened to him. And it was, it was not like anything I had ever heard before. I had never heard someone talk about brotherhood. I had never heard anyone say, we are all God's children. We're all in it together. I had never heard anybody say that there's a great movement for justice. I had never heard anyone say that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice, but you and I have got to jump up and help bend it. Mm -hmm. I had never heard anybody say, join me and make the world a better place. I had never heard. And he said things that opened up a space for me, a depressed, wonky kind of pimple-faced kid, something I could do, and I could kind of crawl out of my depression, and it wouldn't all just be about me and the pain that I felt. And, you know, of course, everybody that was on stage with him that day, that was in the auditorium, just began to march. Um, Most went down that summer to Mississippi. Many had encounters that would change their life. I stayed home with my dad because he was sick. But, you know, shortly afterwards, uh, I was marching in in Chicago. uh, Got arrested, right? Well, when I went to medical school and had a white coat on, the Medical Committee for Human Rights said, uh, come on down to Chicago. Martin Luther King is going to make his uh, uh, march through the city. Uh, We want people wearing white coats with their stethoscopes dangling ostentatiously to form a cordon to protect him. And, uh, yeah, I marched with Martin Luther King. We were all arrested together. And -hmm. uh, and here's a little little secret. Um, If you are ever going to be arrested, I tell my children, for a good (laughs) cause, (laughs) and there are some good causes, uh, get arrested with, you know, two, three, four, five hundred of your best friends (laughs) because then they put you in pretend jail. Yeah. And you pretend arrested, and you can bring a guitar. That's great advice. And, that's <laughs> and, and the cops were wonderful, and it, this was not the kind of scene you think of mm-hmm. as you know, being arrested. This was, they had to arrest us because we were blocking traffic. We had to go uh, into Grant Park. They had to build a, uh, a pretend uh, 
jail, and, and Martin Luther King was there, and he was just kept talking to us. And I can't remember the number of times I marched with him, but it certainly became the organizing principle of my life, uh, the civil rights movement, the movement against the war in Vietnam, and the movement itself, because as it led into the 60s and the 70s, my generation We thought we sensed that right around the corner was a better world, Mm -hmm. a world that had room for all of us, a room where black or white or male or female or tall or short or old or young, that we were all allowed in to this great dream called America. And that was the magic that led to Haight-Ashbury and the the counterculture and all the rest of it. Well, that day did have a profound influence on your life. And uh, as you noted, you became a doctor. I think in part was because your father had cancer. I know you had your own bout with it as well. So I'm going to move to the part of the book which um, really reads like fiction, not great fiction because it's almost too preposterous. And we're going to start <laughs> in 1969 at the infamous Alcatraz prison in San Francisco Bay, and it's going to end in Bola Island in Bangladesh in 1977. Take us on that extraordinary journey. I was in pretend jail in Chicago. It was a real jail at Alcatraz, but, but I wasn't a prisoner. I was finishing up my internship at what was then called Presbyterian Hospital. Now it's called Pacific Medical mm-hmm. Center. The treaties that the Indians had with the United States of America were breached more often than they were upheld. But there was one treaty called the Laramie Treaty that said that if any land having been taken from Indians, any federal land having been taken from Indians is declared surplus, it must first be returned or offered to be returned to the Indians from whom it was taken. It it seemed seemed Mm -hmm. like a fair deal. And Alcatraz was Indian land, and it was seized and um, turned into a prison. And then the prison was closed in the early 60s. And when the prison was closed, uh, a number of Indians invoked the Laramie Treaty and said, give it back. And the government didn't want to do that. So uh, one night, undercover, uh, several dozen young Indians from many different tribes, uh, the Mohawk Indian Uh, Richard Oakes was leading in a Lakota Sioux uh, Indian uh, uh, named John Trudell was uh, later Mm -hmm. one of the leaders. And they uh, occupied Alcatraz before the name Occupy had much meaning. (laughs) Uh, And they took over and they would stay on the island for 18 months. And that became a a big social drama. Every day in the newspapers and TV shows in San Francisco, there'd be interviews with the Coast Guard who were ordered to uh, put a ring around it and uh, embargo and quarantine the island and you know, somehow an interview with uh, Buffy St. Marie who would fly out there and, or Joan Baez who would go yeah. out there or the Grateful Dead would do a concert on, on Alcatraz. And uh, they did a scorecard and they asked uh, people in San Francisco Bay, uh, who do you want to vote for? And they loved the Coast Guard. I mean, <laughs> we do love the Coast Guard in San Francisco. Uh, but it was ninety ten for the Indians over the Coast Guard. Yeah. Um, and this was the most popular occupation imaginable. But there was no water, no electricity, mm-hmm. no medical care. And uh, John Trudell's wife, Lou, uh, was nine months pregnant, and she wanted to give birth to a baby on Indian-held or reclaimed land. And uh, the local columnist said, is there no doctor anywhere? Is there no doctor right. willing to go out there? And, of course, that was made for me. Yeah, absolutely. So you I went out. <laughs> I lived on Alcatraz. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the baby was born and given the name Wavoka a Paiute Sioux Indian medicine man 200 years earlier who had prophesied that after his demise he would return Mm -hmm. in 200 years and it would be the beginning of the return of the Indian way. It was a magical night. A lot of bad things happened. A couple of Green Berets, Indians who had taken some weird drugs, uh, started cutting themselves. There was bleeding. I had to sew people up. And in the end, uh, the Coast Guard had to medevac uh, me and uh, this one former Green Beret who was bleeding pretty badly. And when our boat got to the shore, uh, and I had finished sewing him up, an ambulance came and paramedics took him to the hospital. Then I looked up, and it seemed as if every television camera in the planet you became a media was star. there. And I was asked, what do the Indians want? And, of course, mm-hmm. I had never met an Indian until three weeks earlier. Right. You're their spokesman all of a sudden. (laughs) Which, of course, no white kid from Detroit, (laughs) Michigan could possibly carry that load. But Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers uh, and some friends saw that, saw me on television. And I got a phone call the next day asking if I wanted to join a movie caravan and play the role of a young doctor in a movie that Warner Brothers was making 
kind of like a sequel to Woodstock. Right. A bunch of hippies do rock and roll music, and they wanted a rock doc. Medicine Ball Caravan. Medicine Ball Caravan. And you went around following the likes of Jethro Tull and Grateful Dead and Joni Mitchell and Jefferson Airplane. and B.B. King. Mo- yep, yeah, absolutely. And, and that movie ends, actually, with a concert uh, with Pink Floyd in Canterbury, England, correct? I remember it well, yes. It was incredible. It was, uh, you know, Pink Floyd was amazing. And, of course, I was in the Rock Doc tent taking care of people who'd had minor cuts or bruises mm-hmm. or had, or had taken the wrong pill with the wrong color and trying to bring them down and, and make them healthy. And uh, that was the end of the caravan. Then the caravan's going to start up again from England. You're going to drive across Europe. But instead, uh, fate intervenes, and there's a cyclone in Bangladesh, correct? Yeah, I mean, what happened was, uh, you, you know, I've all heard the expression, you're either on the bus or off the bus, <laughs> the Ken Kesey expression. Uh, we started off driving my wife and I, uh, Elaine was her name at that time, uh, before she changed her name to Girija. Uh But Elaine and I had a little um, microbus. We had a VW, so we were like the caboose. Uh, there were 25 or 30 big buses, and then there was our little putt-putt, the doctor's uh, VW. And over time, the charm of being on the real bus and being part of, uh, for me, the hog farm commune, uh, Wavy Gravy's commune, the old Merry Pranksters, that became pretty seductive. And when we got to England, a lot of the people were going home mm-hmm. after the formal Warner Brothers movie ended. A lot of others were thinking, yeah, can we get a couple of buses here and, yeah, and drive to going. Kathmandu? <laughs> ka, 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 ka. Kathmandu. And it was the time of the hippie trail. Yeah, sure, 1970 or so. Yeah, that was time. Just yeah, yeah. succeeding the Silk Road. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we did. So we did a concert at the Round Tree uh, with Stone Ground, the band from the the film we raised ten thousand dollars we brought a bought a german man bus and a a british leyland transport and we had these two buses with 40 young people living in (laughs) various different arrangements (laughs) living on that bus and the trip took us well over a year Mm -hmm. Um, but i have to say this we drove through uh, turkey iran afghanistan iraq pakistan these are names that when you hear them today you tense up it wasn't like that. Yeah. They were the nicest people in the world. And, and again, we, just as in walking in Nepal, we looked like Martians. Mm-hmm. I mean, can you imagine a bus, you know, psychedelic painted buses and, and hippies wandering off wearing feather dusters and, you know, looking like cartoon characters? But everybody treated us so well. In fact, I can't tell you, Afghanistan once, Iran once, um, in Pakistan several times, we'd be taken into the smallest little villages off the road. And, and if it was a Buddhist village, there'd be a little shrine with a statue of Buddha. If it was a Hindu, there'd be a shrine uh, to, you know, to Shiva or to Ram. And if it was a Muslim village, there'd be a, a little uh, a drawing maybe of the Kaaba of, of Mecca. And right next to that holy of holy places, there'd be a photograph framed of John F. Kennedy. Huh. It's going to be a long time before there's another photograph of an American president in those villages. In those places, that's for sure. And that's, that, to me, is the saddest part about having had this experience that my children cannot have now. Yeah. My kids can't go, and they can't go to Landi Kotal in the Khyber Pass. Yeah. And they can't walk up and down through Iran, and we can't see these people as anything other than through the lens of the military mm-hmm. efforts that have gone and it isn't like that. That's not who they are. Mm-hmm. And this is not, not who was. we are. Yeah. Well, you end up in a Himalayan monastery. What happens there? Uh, so uh, when I was an intern, uh, you don't get a lot of days off, but I got Thursdays off. A fellow named Baba Ram Das, used to be called Richard Alpert, had been a professor at Harvard. Uh, he was doing three lectures in San Francisco every Thursday night, as it turned out, at the Unitarian Church. And uh, he had just come back from India. He had become Baba Ramdas because he had met a guru. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the guru's name was Neem Karoli Baba, um, called also Maharaji. And, uh, you know, people kind of hid his location. It was kind of opaque where he lived. But this guy Ramdas, uh, he had a way about him, not unlike Martin Luther King that when you listened to him, the world stopped. I mean, I remember him telling a story of a 
young man who was asked to kill a chicken. Mm -hmm. And his dad told him, take the chicken out where nobody can see you and cut off its throat, cut its throat. And after a couple hours, the com guy comes back to his dad and says, I didn't do it. He says, why didn't you kill the chicken? He says, you told me to take the chicken out and kill it where no one sees. But everywhere I go, the chicken sees. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of light humor, but, you know, if you think about that, a little deeper wisdom, coupled with the fact that, you know, he'd be talking about God or the meaning of life and trying to open the way to think about Judaism and Christianity and Islam mm -hmm. and Buddhism, and there'd be a baby crying, and he would just incorporate that into his... I could never reproduce what Ramdas did that night, but it was magical. And all of a sudden, on the bus trip now, years later, we are driving into India after having gone through, you know, the journey to the East. We, yep. Every night we read uh, the book, Journey to the East, uh, and here we are. We're driving into New Delhi, and like all the other kids on the road, we wanted to get our mail, and you got your mail at the American Express office. So we're parked in Connaught Circus, walking into... Uh, American Express, and who's in line in front of us? Ramdas, <laughs> that same guy who, was on, you know, put us on top of the world years earlier. And uh, one thing led to the other. My wife became extremely interested in the teaching of Ramdas and his guru, mm -hmm. and she immediately went to live in the ashram. And I wasn't as smart as she was. I never have been. And uh, I stayed on the hippie trail for another six months, came back to San Francisco, paid off our debts, and then uh, my wife and I had some tough negotiating over yeah. crackling phone lines when uh -huh. I was in San Francisco saying, come home, and she was saying, no, you come to the Himalayas and meet <laughs> Maharaji. Sounds like and, not the first one you lost. <laughs> no, I, well, I got lucky. There was a war. <laughs> and uh, all the Westerners were kicked out of India because the India-Pakistan war happened. Mm -hmm, right. And so she came home, but only on the provision that after we cleared up my medical school debts uh, that we would that go back. back. And we did. And we mm -hmm. went back, and we 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 met. I met this teacher named Karoli Baba, who at first I thought was a cult, and I didn't want to touch his mm -hmm. feet. They had all these idols there. I mean, you know, yeah. it was really— not your cup of tea. was not my cup of tea. And then after about a week, I was totally hooked, mm. <laughs> hook, line, and sinker. And I'll tell you why that was. I mean, you know, you can talk about theology or you can talk about meditation or the practices, but for me it was pretty simple. I would sit in front of this strange-looking man. He was a fat Indian, old, wrapped in a blanket, looked like came a Scottish plaid blanket. And, and I sat there, and he would just emanate a feeling that he loved everybody in the world. Yeah. And that wasn't what did it for me. Mm -hmm. You know, in, a, in my young 26-year-old way, I sort of thought he should love everybody in the world. He's a guru, right? <laughs> That's sort of his job. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what got me. What got me is that when I sat in front of him, I loved everybody in the world. Yeah. Unconditionally. I mean, and, and it didn't, you know, I forgave the guys at the hospital who had taken my photograph that was on a medical magazine and put it on the bulletin boards with the hypodermic needle in my nose mm -hmm. saying, we welcome our young radical doctor. I forgave everybody. I, I, I didn't feel hatred at all. And so, so it was what happened to me, the feeling that I had of this universality that made me realize that whatever this guy has learned Whatever he's doing, I want some of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why I stayed. Well, then your guru or your yogi speaks to you about smallpox. What's going on in the world around smallpox at that time, and what does he tell you? Well, I was um, like everybody else there at the ashram. We'd come in in the morning, and we'd meditate, and he would come in, and uh, we'd sit around him and it's called darshan it's, mm -hmm. it's like having an audience and, and audience means to hear the pope or to hear someone you respect darshan means to see them and it's the same idea and uh it was just kind of an ordinary day that, that the rhythm of the ashram was going they'd be praying and chanting and singing and walking around and you know going through the little town and looking at all the temples and and this one day he just called me in, and, and the name that he had given me was Dr. America. Right. <laughs> so he would go, Dr. America! 
And I didn't even like the name because, you know, Ramdas got a name, yeah. Ramdas, Dwarkanath, Krishnadas, the mm. Das brothers. I wanted to... Yeah. I wanted a spiritual name. Well, a little more exotic than Dr. America, <laughs> Dr. but that's America. what you got. That's the name that I got. He called. He said, Dr. America. And, and I, I came in and he said, how much money do you have? And I went, I mean, my first reaction was, I thought this guy was above money. Yeah. And now, what's he going to do? This is what this is all about, yeah. That, you know, I'm thinking every little paranoid bit that I thought that I had squished in mm-hmm. my brain came back up and he said how much money do you have and I and I thought about it. I said I have five hundred dollars he, he like, would turn his head back he said five hundred dollars that's not a lot of money is that all you have and I said yes that's all I have he said oh that's all you have here mm. what do you have back in America and I'm thinking this is really gonna <laughs> and, and, and I said well I have five hundred dollars there too yeah. and then he said in a sing-song way 500 here, 500 there. That's not much money. He's doing all this in Hindi. Mm-hmm. Uh, 500 here, 500 here. That's not much money. And then he looked at me and he said, you're going to have to go to work? And I'm thinking, work? Well, no, we're living in a monastery. Yeah. We're not- <laughs> I'm meditating all day. <laughs> he said, you're going to have to go to work. I said, work? He said, no. He said, $500. That's not much money. You are no doctor. I said, he said, you are no doctor, and this is all in, in Hindi. Right. You are tumto doctor nahin. Mm-hmm. You are no doctor. And then he goes into English, and he says, you are no doctor in English. And then he says, you are no doctor, U-N-O doctor. U-N-O doctor. U-N-O doctor. You're going to be a U-N doctor. Mm-hmm. You're going to go work for the United Nations. That's right. I can see it now. You're going to go work for the United Nations. You're going to give vaccinations in villages, and you're going to help eradicate smallpox, a terrible disease that's been killing children. This is God's gift to humanity, that this one burden, this one disease that has killed people for thousands of years. It's going to be obliterated. It's going to be unmulen, which means literally pull out the root. It's uh-huh. the same word in Hindi as eradicate. And you know smallpox from nothing. Well, I think in medical school there might have been one mm-hmm. slide in, a, in <laughs> one course on tropical yeah. medicine. But, but, no, I'd seen children in India while mm-hmm. I was there with pockmarked faces, blind and pockmarked faces. Uh, in that year, there were a quarter of a million children who were afflicted in India with smallpox. So you have to go to the World Health Organization's offices to see if you can get a job, which is about – a long, long trip. Tell us how that all went down. <laughs> well, after he said that I was going to go become a United Nations medical officer, it was just so preposterous to me. I mean, you know, I was a hippie. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd graduated medical school and done an internship. That was it. I'd never had a job. You know, I ran away with the circus. I, I yeah. didn't have a job. And uh, I just wanted to pretend he never said it. So for the next couple of weeks... Gerge and I would avoid him, and we wouldn't (laughs) go. We hoped he wouldn't raise the subject again. It was too embarrassing because it just – I was so inadequate. And after a couple of weeks, he said, did you get your job yet? (laughs) And I said, no, Maharaji. It's just – did you go to WHO? I said, no, Maharaji. He said, go right now. Go right now. So we had to take a taxi to the bus station, Mm -hmm. take a bus, take a, a taxi and then a rickshaw and go to the WHO office and I walked in there Lord help me I walked in there with hair down to the middle of my back Mm -hmm. a big bushy beard down to my belly and I was still wearing an ashram gown that looked like a dress (laughs) and I mean where to change (laughs) yeah and good luck and and I walked in there and they looked at me and they said what are you here for (laughs) and I said well my guru who lives in the Himalayas says that I am here to work with you to help eradicate smallpox. It is God's gift to humanity uh-huh. because of the hard work of dedic and that was it. I was out yeah, there. I mean, and I went back to see my heart. She said, Did you get your job? I said, No, my he said, Go back. And it, I went back again and after four or five times you know, I, I got a little smarter. I trimmed the beard. I put on pants. Yeah. I got a shirt. And this is a 17-hour trip. This it's is just not down hour, the street. Yeah, this is not down the street. And I would come back and I would say no. And, and after a while, I was getting kind of old. Yeah. I mean, even for somebody who was enthralled by the ashram and the monastic life, this was getting old. And then uh, one day he said, uh, you know, something like, did you get your job yet? And I said, no. He said, Go right now. Go this very minute. 
And we were at his other ashram, which was only about a four-hour uh, ride away. Mm -hmm. We took a rickshaw to a train, a train to Delhi, a Delhi rickshaw. And I walked in, and by this time I had had a white shirt, but still no tie, no shirt. Mm -hmm. Everybody else had. When I walked into the office, the receptionist named uh, Edna Boyer, who was an Anglo-Indian, her mom had been Indian, her dad had been a British officer, and, you know, she didn't look like the other Indians, didn't wear a sari, uh, and she was always very kind to me. And I, I walked in there, and there was another American there, and he looked like a big, he looked like a football coach. Yeah. And I walked in, he said, uh, son, uh, what are you doing here? Who are you? I said, oh, uh, my guru who lives in the Himalayas <laughs> says that I'm supposed to come work for the smallpox program. Did you know that this is God's gift to humanity? Because, <laughs> and I said, uh, who are you? He said, Oh, my name's D.A. Henderson. I'm the head of the smallpox yeah. program, and I'm here from Geneva. Uh, but, you know, we have no smallpox program in India. It's not one of Mrs. Gandhi's priorities. That's right. And that's actually why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm here to go see her and try to convince her that we should have a program here. And he said, I said, okay. And I sat down, and I was despondent. And uh, Mrs. Boyer came up and said, um, you know, the— the French woman who runs the smallpox program asked you if you want to come up and be interviewed. And so I went up to her office, uh, Nicole Grasset. Mm -hmm. I mean, she looked like she was out of the pages of Vogue or had been <laughs> walking down the Champs de Lycée. You know, yeah. she didn't look like the other people in India looked. And, and there was D.A. Henderson. And, and she said, look, uh, we can't hire you. There's no job. But D.A. Henderson said he'd interview you for the record. And he did. He took me aside. He interviewed me. Years later... After we eradicated smallpox, 10 years later, DA asked me to go back to India. By then, I was a professor at Michigan and asked me to close down the shop because mm -hmm. we had finished eradicating, take all the records, take them back to the United States, microfilm them, put them in order so that there'd be a historical record. I found his interview of me. <laughs> oh, wow. And he said, I've just interviewed a young man named Larry Brilliant. He says he's a doctor. He doesn't look like a doctor. Yeah. He appears to have gone native. Uh -huh. Nice kid. I hope he does well. But he's got no training. Yeah. He's got no medical training after internship. And we don't have a program, so there's no job for him. Good luck, kid. I mean, it was, that was it. But eventually you do get hired, and probably predominantly because you speak Hindi, and you can type, and you begin to work on that program. And I think the strategy for that program working in India around smallpox was really started by Bill Fagey. That's right. Who went on to be the head of the CDC. I think he was very influential in Bill Gates' life in terms of having him support global health. What was his strategy that saved the world from smallpox? Well, the first thing was, in order to hire me, Nicole had to create a lower category than had ever been created. <laughs> Congratulations. So I was not hired as a doctor. Mm -hmm. I was hired, as you say, as a typist, and I could speak Hindi and Indians liked me. I liked India, and I was comfortable with the customs. I lived in India for almost 10 years. And then uh, after I was working as a typist for about six months, the big program began, which was to be search and containment, to find every single case of smallpox everywhere in the world at the same time mm. and draw a ring of immunity around it instead of just uh, kind of haphazardly vaccinating everybody that you can. And that was Bill's strategy. He created that. Um, and on the eve of the first All India Search, uh, there was a shortfall in uh, epidemiologists and some of the professors, and these were all professors uh -huh. 15 years older than me, and DA is almost 20 years older than me. I was the youngest person ever hired by WHO. I'm, I'm 26 at that point. These are all people in their 50s. And the, a professor of uh, epidemiology from uh, Leningrad, from uh, a Russian, uh, couldn't make it. A couple other people couldn't make it. And uh, Nicole said to Bill, do you want to try the kid? <laughs> I mean, I can't even imagine what that conversation was like. Do you want to try the rookie? I mean, put him in, coach. And, and, and Bill offered to take me to the field my first time. Mm -hmm. My first time in a village with smallpox was with Bill Fagey. And I remember going into this village, uh, and we didn't find any smallpox. Mm. And uh, the driver said, let's go. And Bill said, no, there's probably some smallpox here. And um, no, we couldn't find any. We went door to door. No one had smallpox. And Bill said to me, you speak Hindi. Why don't you tell them 
the tallest man in the world has come to their village, and let's see what the kids do. And uh, I translated into Hindi, and the, the head man repeated, the tallest man, Bill's six, seven, six, eight, uh, the tallest man in the world. And all of a sudden, these kids come flocking in, and we see children with smallpox on their arms, on their face. And then we start asking, well, how many cases are there at home? And we're brought back and behind the purda, behind the curtain. And we found children who were dying of smallpox. Oh, man. And I had never seen anything so horrible in my life. Uh, my reaction, in retrospect, was crazy. I said, but, you know, how do you call 911? I mean, how do we get an ambulance? And Bill put his arm on me and said, listen, son, there's no treatment. Hmm. There's nothing you can do. That's why we have to eradicate this. We have to prevent it. Every single case. Every single one. Mm -hmm. Because no child should be in the situation that these are in right now. And I was crying. Like I mean, I'd, yeah. Not only did I not look like a U.N. officer, I didn't look like a doctor. I was mm -hmm. crying like a baby. And then he said to me, every one of us has been exactly where you are right now, crying in the face of this unimaginable suffering and feeling so helpless and now you're going to have to go through a transition where you can't be a clinical doctor and think only of that one child in front of you. You've got to think as an epidemiologist yeah, yeah. of all the people with hundreds of thousands of children in India that have this disease, and we have to build a program that scales, that's well managed. It's going to be difficult, but I think you can do it. Yeah. And at this time in India, the rivers are not even flowing because there are so many dead bodies in them. And what you then proceed Well, I, I just, I mean, I, that, that was only true for one river, yeah. and that was in a place called Tata Nagar, okay. the, the main city of the Tatas, then the largest mm -hmm. corporation in India. And uh, I never saw that. Mm -hmm. but th certainly that was the rumor that there were so many uh, dead children that the rivers didn't run. Um, but Tatanagar had become the largest exporter of smallpox in the world. Mm -hmm. That was when we were close to cleaning up, finishing smallpox everywhere else. But this one industrial town was like, you know, Detroit in the 60s or Pittsburgh. It was a place that uh, you could always go and get a job. And so young, uneducated Indians from all over the world came there, got a job or were looking for a job, contracted smallpox, and then wanted to go home and die and got on a train and carried smallpox back all over. And that's where we heard that there were the rivers were so clogged with... So you begin to go door to door, and I think at this time you then reproduce a picture, which at that time was the most reproduced picture in the world. Tell us about that. So that was, I didn't reproduce that, but it was reproduced uh, by CDC. Right. It was a young boy whose name was Muhammad Ali, a different Muhammad Ali, right. obviously. And his, uh, he was a Pakistani. And uh, a CDC uh, epidemiologist was living in the area that uh, this family got smallpox, and one brother got it, another brother got it, and this little baby then got it, and the moment that the baby got a rash, the CDC epidemiologist came back and photographed him every day and chronicled and documented what the evolution of the smallpox rash was. Mm -hmm. And then that photo was reproduced as a placard. Okay. And every one of us carried it because India had 1,200 languages. Smallpox was called uh, Chechek mm -hmm. and Shitlama, Mariama, Bashanto. And so you couldn't, you couldn't say, is this disease in your, you know, in your house? But you showed the picture and said, is there any child that has a disease like this? And then inevitably you'd be taken in. We also turned it into leaflets. We dropped it from helicopters. I got into trouble dropping leaflets of all things. Again, God forgive me, on top of the WHO building. <laughs> it, I, was, I got a little enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. And uh, even my wife went up in helicopters. Right, I remember a Russian named Raikushin who was dropping these leaflets all over India, the Indian. Of all the different kind of structures in the Indian government, it was the Indian Air Force that really liked the idea of eradicating smallpox. They had seen so many children die of smallpox mm. in, the, in the Air Force barracks. And they would give us planes, and we were all over the place uh, dropping these leaflets. And you're leading a peacetime army of 100,000 or so in northern India, and eventually this culminates in Bola Island in Bangladesh in 1977. Tell us about that moment. So uh, the last case of smallpox in India uh, was a woman named Saiban Bibi, who was a Bangladeshi who had 
crossed over into Assam, mm-hmm. which is a northern state of India. And she was, um, you know, smallpox made her destitute. She was a beggar. And she kind of just got on a train and went across the border. And there were increasing number of importations into India as Pakistan had eradicated smallpox, Nepal and Sri Lanka had eradicated smallpox. India was now free, but there were cases coming across from Bangladesh. And uh, I was asked to go to, to Bangladesh. They were struggling with the very last cases in the world. And I was sent down to Bola Island, which was the same island mm-hmm. that had had that horrible cyclone in 1972 that the hog farm had had its first idea to bring medicine to the survivors of that cyclone. Ironically, I went down to Bola Island and I sat in front of this young girl, Rahima Banu, who was the last case of smallpox, the last case of virula major, of killer smallpox. Mm-hmm. There's another milder form. The last case of killer smallpox in the world. And I meditated and sat in front of her and I realized that when... She coughed, and the last viruses left her body and landed on the soil in front of her in in Bangladesh, and the sun killed off those viruses. That was the end of an unbroken chain of transmission that went back to Pharaoh Ramses. Yeah, that's right. That was it. Now that I'm an adult and I see a world filled with so much hate and pessimism, I think back to that moment, how could anyone not be optimistic When you think that a disease that killed half a billion people, 500 million people uh, only a generation ago, that that disease is gone, and we did it by Russians and Americans working together, Indians, doctors from 30 countries, that's what makes me optimistic. And she is the symbol to me of the end of one form of suffering and to me, as a religious person, the symbol of what my guru had said would happen. <laughs> and it did. It's one of the extraordinary achievements in human history. And, you know, an interesting footnote of that is that that vaccine for smallpox was actually found around 200 years earlier by Edward Jenner. And the story around it is utterly fascinating, <laughs> pun intended. Tell us about it. I do love looking back into history and seeing some of these ridiculous, uh, crazy ideas. Uh, I, I forgot what the aphorism is. Uh, they First, they... They laugh at you, then they deny what you're saying, then they indict you, then they agree with you, then they steal your idea. Um, (laughs) That's that's a progression. So this fellow uh, who made his name studying uh, cuckoo birds, and many people thought of him as cuckoo, um, uh, Edward Jenner, uh, he observed the aphorism that they used to say in England at the time, 1790s, that she had a complexion as pretty as a milkmaid. That's right. In fact, we've said things like Mm -hmm. that even 20, 30 years ago, if you read literature from the 50s. And I always thought it meant that let milkmaids drink milk, and that gave them a nice complexion. I I may have taken a glass of milk or two myself as a a young teenager with acne. (laughs) Um, But that's not what it meant. It meant that everybody else had pox on their face and scars Mm -hmm. on their face except milkmaids. And he reasoned, why was this? Why, why did a milkmaid not have pox on their face? And he saw that sometimes milkmaid had pox marks on their fingers. And these were the fingers that had milked a cow. And then he looked on the cow, and the udder, the nipple of the cow, mm-hmm. had on it a pock mark. And somehow, remember, nobody knows germ theory yep. at this time. There's not been a microscope yet. We think that miasmas and bad air caused diseases in the 1790s. And he thinks, well, maybe something hopped from that cow's udder to the finger of the milkmaid. And then she was spared from getting smallpox on her face. And then he does something absolutely crazy. (laughs) He takes the oozy pus. (laughs) No other way to say it. And he puts it into the arm of a young boy and the boy's name is Phelps and he carves a little scratch on the boy's arm and puts that oozy pus in and then he tells the boy go out to a village near London that's filled with smallpox and he puts him into the marketplace and the boy comes back and they wait one week, two weeks, three weeks 
and he doesn't have smallpox. Mm. And he, you know, by the reasoning of the time, he should have had smallpox. And Jenner takes this idea and he believes now, and you got to understand, this is a medical impossibility at the time. Yeah. It's a transspecial immunogenicity. And he goes to the Royal Society, which is the oldest learned academy in the world, and he says, my idea is that if we take oozing pus from the fingers of milkmaids and we give it to children, they will be spared from smallpox. And they laugh him out <laughs> uh, over and over again. For years, they laugh him out. And over time, people begin to realize that there is a disease, cowpox, which if you get it, it protects you from smallpox. And because the process of scratching uh, the hand with the cowpox uh, used to be called inoculation, mm -hmm. he changed it to vaccination. That's where vaccine came from, right? That's where vaccine came from. Yeah. And the word vaccine, do you know what it means? It means cow, cow. Mm -hmm. vacas. Mm -hmm. So every time you're sending your kid out to get a, you know, measles vaccine or influenza vaccine, you're giving them a cow. Vaccine means cow. And so I just, I just love the story of how we've all taken cows <laughs> to protect us from the worst diseases in the world. Well, that is a great story. I'm going to fast forward to 2006, and you, Larry, have just been awarded the TED Prize. And in your speech, you stated that your one wish for the world was to build a global system to detect each new disease or disaster as quickly as it emerges or occurs. Now, as I understand it, and I may be wrong, if nothing were to be done, scientists believe that we are headed for an era of pandemics. But the tools and technologies you spoke about in 2006, well, they're coming online now to address these outbreaks. So let me ask you about each. First, why are we headed toward an age of pandemics? Oh, I think we're already here. Yeah. Uh, Zika, Ebola, right. SARS, MERS, uh, swine flu, bird flu, all of these diseases. Uh, more people. We're living closer together. We've cut down forests that used to be uh, places that only animals lived with their viruses. HIV AIDS jumped from uh, chimpanzees and monkeys to humans. Many of the diseases that we know, like Ebola, jumped from bats to humans. SARS was mm -hmm. a, a bat disease that jumped to a civet cat in a wet market in Hong Kong. And so these, these are zoonotic diseases, and over the past 30 years, there have been 30 novel zoonotic diseases with pandemic potential. And as we move more into animal area and consume more consume animals, animals yeah. I mean, mm. last year, Africans alone consumed 1.8 billion wild animals. We're heading into what looks like a prolonged battle uh, with these new diseases. In fact, the other day I was talking to some people who, with the money from USAID and others, are trying to put together an atlas of all the bad viruses in animals everywhere in the world to try to understand what the possible scope and scale of the problem are. So that, that's one thing. I, I think we're in for a photo finish mm -hmm. against Zika, which is potentially one of the worst diseases we've seen since HIV AIDS. But the photo finish is because just as modernity is creating the circumstances that puts us more at risk of a pandemic, the same modernity is giving us the technology yeah. to avert getting those pandemics. And the major, major part of that technology uh, is uh, the ability to have early warning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the digital disease detection systems, uh, when I was at Google, we built Google Flu Trends. Uh, now there's participatory surveillance health map out of Harvard, Boston yep. Children's Hospital. And it now is running a program called Flu Near You. That's able to show where influenza is in the United States a week or two before CDC is uh, hmm. because people are online and they're... They're getting a little email or a text message uh, every Monday or Tuesday saying, are you sick or are you well? They answer it, and you can make a spot map immediately of the country and, wow. and see where the disease is. Mm -hmm. and, and the most important thing I learned in smallpox is that early detection, early response, that mantra mm -hmm. is what made it possible to eradicate smallpox. And that's true for polio and every other disease, Ebola which took six months to detect. That's the reason that WHO and the rest of the world fell behind it. And there's sort of a mathematical progression 
if every virus leads to, every disease leads to three more every two or three days or every week, you can see that if you leave that unattended for six months, you have a billion cases. Yeah, it happens fast. And, and you can't do anything much if you start off with a billion sick people. But if it's one case leads to three, leads to nine, leads to 27, and you're there after there's only three cases, yeah. then it's pretty easy to draw a ring around it. Even if you don't have a vaccine or an antiviral, if you just quarantine the old fashioned way. So we're now in a position where the tools for early detection are growing, becoming more sophisticated. And especially these informal networks, which were never allowed before, correct? That's right. Until 2006, mm -hmm. the World Health Organization and the United Nations were very stiff. Uh, they had by <laughs> contract, by treaty, by agreement, that WHO could not take cognizance, could not notice, could not act on a report that came from just a regular person uh, about a new outbreak of an exotic disease. That, that report had to go to your local doctor, had to put it to the hospital, had to put it to your district or state, to your country, and then only your health minister or health secretary was allowed to call WHO. <laughs> uh, in 2006, that was all changed, and new... Uh, global treaty called the International Health Regulations was um, ratified, mm -hmm. which now says WHO must take action if they get a phone call from a citizen, if they get a phone call from a church, if they get a phone call from a hospital, or if they get an electronic message from one of these new digital systems. That's a game changer. Well, let me tell you how much of a changer it is. Uh, we estimate, it's only an estimate, that 15 years ago, the first case of one of these bad bugs, uh, these pandemic potential um, viruses that jump from an animal to a human, the first case took six months mm -hmm. to be reported uh, to WHO and acted upon. Now we're down to two, three, four weeks. Yeah. And if we can get that number down so it's less than an incubation period, mm -hmm. then I think that in the, uh, in the photo finish, That's a photo finish between humans and, uh, and bugs... Humans are going to win. <laughs> if we don't, then, um, well, I don't think I can bet on the bugs. <laughs> yeah. I'm much, much less optimistic. Right, um, for sure. Let me take you to one of your current reincarnations, and that's the chairman of the Skoll Global Threats Fund, which was started by the eBay founder, Jeffrey Skoll. Now, there are five global threats that they've identified, climate change, water security, pandemics, nuclear proliferation, and the Middle East conflict. So let me ask, Larry, at a time when organizations are trying to narrow their focus so they can have an impact, why would an institution come into being with such a daunting agenda? Well, Jeff Skoll is a lovely, wonderful man, and uh, he not only started the Skoll Global Threats Fund, he started the Skoll Foundation, That's right. which he's endowed with a billion dollars mm -hmm. and uh, has funded over uh, close to 100 social entrepreneurs to start them on their way in a whole variety of different activities. The, these young kids, the, you meet them, and it looks like they've got searchlights in the middle of their forehead, and they really inspire you. Uh, he also started Participant Media, right. which just won the Oscar for uh, Spotlight and, mm -hmm. and did movies like Contagion and uh, you know, Last Chance, Marigold Hotel, and so many other, The Visitor, The Soloist, so many other great movies. Uh, so he's, he's a pretty eclectic guy. <laughs> I gave a speech at the Skoll War Forum one year, and I met Jeff, and I said, have you been to India? And he said, not much. And I said, oh, all the things you're doing, if you haven't been to India, you've wasted your entire life. It's, you have to come <laughs> to India. So he came to India, and we spent a week going around and looking at the new modern uh, companies. Mm -hmm. But I also took him to villages that had little children with polio. I showed him where the last cases of smallpox were. I took him up to my ashram, and we traveled the length and breadth of India together, and he came back saying, you know, all these good things that he was trying to do with his movies and the Skoll Foundation and all these other people, these new philanthropists, the Medicis from Silicon Valley, uh, the Benioffs of the world, mm -hmm. um, all the good things that people are trying to do in the face of that, there are a category of events that could happen, maybe low probability, but highly consequential, that could bring humanity to our knees. Mm -hmm. And he had his list. Everybody has their own list. And his list was pandemics. It was nuclear war. It was water. And certainly it was climate change and regional conflagrations that become 
world wars. So he said, I'm going to start an organization that looks just at these global threats. And that was the rationale. Because whether you're talking about cyber terrorism or bioterrorism, the instrumentality can be a virus that's an organism or a virus which is a computer virus. But the motivations of the people who are willing to let loose these horrible things will be the same. Yeah. So you can gain a lot by looking at the governance issues, the psychological and social issues. Hmm. If you're looking at water and climate, there are people who argue the effects on the world are the same, that because of climate change, water... They're all interrelated, in other words. so interrelated, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And I just take my hat off to him for being brave and courageous enough to, uh, to create something with such a daunting... Uh, <laughs> vision. Yeah, absolutely. Let me get you out on this. You have said uh, that you've often wrestled with the meaning of this line. Live your life without ambition, but live as those who are ambitious. What does that phrase mean to you, Larry? That's a line from a theosophical uh, book uh, called Light on the Path by Mabel Collins. And, um, you know, I think if you're doing good work because you're hoping to get a Nobel Prize or be feted at the next meeting of the hospital board, that's great. Mm-hmm. Whatever your motivation is, the good work that you're doing will live after you, and it's, it's noble and wonderful. But there is another level. We all know people like this in our life, the people who do great work, and then when it comes time to get the awards, they're the ones you can't find. (laughs) Uh, We know people in our Boy Scout groups and in our church groups. We know people in our schools who are always there, always doing the work, but not the first to say, I did it. Yeah. Not the first to take credit. And to be ambitious to do good, I think that's Christian, it's Jewish, it's Buddhist, it's Hindu. It's the highest of all of ours. And then to say, I'm doing it for God, Uh, I'm doing it for the greater good. I'm doing it for the kids. I'm not doing it for me. That's that's a little harder. Mm -hmm. And that's what my teacher told me I should do. Now, I fail every day 100 times. I mean, in in this last two-minute conversation, I failed 50 times. You shouldn't be afraid of failing. Mm -hmm. You should aspire, I think, to do the best you can with the tools you've been given and not worry so much about taking credit, even if you're thinking about your own enlightened self-interest and counting karma points. Yeah. Leave that for the others. It's intrinsic motivation, not extrinsic, that really makes the difference. Well, Dr. Larry Brilliant, I want to thank you so much for being with us this evening. The book, again, is Sometimes Brilliant. It's published by Harper Collins. And not only is it a wonderful read of a remarkable life, but the wisdom and insights provided will better inform your own life and your search for meaning in it. It was a real pleasure to have you on the show, Larry. Thank you. The Business of Giving can be heard every Sunday evening between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern on AM 970 The Answer in New York and on iHeartRadio. You can follow us at Biz of Give on Twitter and at Facebook.com slash Business of Giving.